So as I said, this is the most fun panel here today because we get to talk about streaming. Uh, and what we're really going to discuss is uh, how Stranger Things gets to your TV, right? Um, it's going to be about the programming that's coming into our homes, how it gets there, and why that's important. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. I sort of divided our conversation into three sections. The first is going to be about the infrastructure, the fiber cables and such that get the content into our homes. Uh, secondly, we're going to talk about the content itself, not just what we're all watching, although we probably will talk about that, uh, but why it matters, why representation matters, why uh, different types of content being delivered uh, globally matter. And then finally, I'll, I'll ask a few spicy questions, but not too spicy. So we're not previewing the new season of Stranger Things? <laughs> That's next year, I think. Oh, I'm on the wrong panel, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so I'm going to start with a question for Netflix, because Netflix is cool. And also because I think that Netflix has a very cool perspective as to uh, how content comes into our homes. And it may be a little bit different than folks think. Uh, so, Tamar, I'm hoping you can talk us through the whole, what we call the internet investment chain. Um, for those in the room who might not understand, can you take us through what a content delivery network is and what it does and how it works? Yeah. Thanks, Anne, and uh, thanks, everybody, for, for joining. It's great to be here in, in DC today. Uh, I'm usually based in Paris, France. Uh, I'm an engineer uh, by training. I've built internet infrastructure for 15 years, and now I support the uh, global uh, public policy at uh, Netflix. At the risk of making it sound less cool than Anne uh, hyped things up, uh, streaming is just a good metaphor for the internet itself. Uh, the endless possibilities, the diversity of content that you can find on uh, streaming services is just a good metaphor for, 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 for the internet overall. And indeed, it is a whole chain of, uh, of stakeholders connecting to each other. Internet stands for uh, the interconnection of networks. There's more than 70,000 networks around the world that interconnect. Netflix is uh, just one of them. And the value uh, of the internet is that all of those networks uh, can connect uh, to each other and exchange, uh, in our case, content, but uh, services. And so there's this kind of uh, network effect or virtual circle whereby great content, uh, such as Stranger Things, but such as Zoom and, and all the other day-to-day -day applications, uh, kind of uh, feeds into the value of accessing the internet, internet connections, uh, which then uh, creates demand for the services, uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. So you have this uh, kind of um, flywheel effect. Uh, so this entire value chain that we will describe and that is represented on the panel here today, invests in various shape or form. For Netflix, the primary investment is content itself. We spend around half of our revenue back into making more movies and TV shows that we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but it also takes shape in uh, technical investments to, make, to deliver the content to uh, the homes. Uh, so we call it... Uh, Open Connect, it's Netflix uh, in-house uh, content delivery network. And what it is, is really a distribution of uh, caching servers all around the world to store content closer to our subscribers. I uh, hope uh, that many of them are in the room today. Uh, so Open Connect was started 10 years ago. Netflix has invested over a billion dollars uh, into, into building Open Connect. It's made of, of 18,000 uh, servers distributed around the world in 6,000 locations, and a lot of them are, are, are in the U.S. We're present in all 50 states, as you can see on this, uh, um, on this map. And what it means is that when you press play on Netflix, the streams actually come from around the corner. They don't come from Hollywood or, or some big internet hub uh, somewhere uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the big cities. It, it's actually from each state, from, from, from around the corner. Um, it's great for Netflix and our subscribers, obviously, because it makes the quality of the streams better. It's why Netflix uh, works well. Uh, it's also good uh, for networks uh, because they save money on the long distance network by storing content closer to the, uh, to the consumption point. Uh, and then lastly, it's, it's also good for any other uh, internet service uh, because it makes way uh, and saves capacity on the long distance network for the services that would not be cacheable otherwise. So if you think of a Zoom call or telemedicine consultation, where, where obviously that cannot be cached to this live communication, it needs to go on the long distance pipes. Netflix does not need to go, so we engineer it in a way that, is, that, that it does not go uh, on the long distance pipes. 
Thanks, Toma. Um, I want to ask a similar question, but of our more traditional infrastructure, the way we normally think about how the internet is delivered, right, through um, cable pipes in the ground. So my first question is going to be for Angie. Um, you represent any number of the folks who deliver broadband in the way that we tr more traditionally think about it than a CDN. Um, could you talk to us a little bit more about the investment that those companies and organizations have made? Sure. Thanks so much for having me. So Encompass is the Internet and Competitive Networks Association, and we're really uniquely positioned because we're a trade association that does represent competitive broadband providers, as you mentioned, Anne. But we also have a number of others in the Internet value chain that we represent, those who are offer offering voice, data, messaging services online, as well as the great content that so many people want in streaming, such as Netflix and YouTube television, including, you know, my myself and my own kids, I mean, gaming and cloud computing. So, min so many important services that are bringing more affordability to both consumers and to businesses. We have all of that in Encompass. So when we look at the investment that is being made, it's really important to keep in mind that there is investment by network companies. These are last mile, middle mile, long mile networks that are going in. And a lot of it is private sector money. So the estimate is anywhere between 70 to $80 billion annually here in the US. And then you also have the public sector that is making significant investment in these networks. Traditionally, the Federal Communications Commission has a universal service fund, and that has provided significant investment for several decades now into the networks. And then, as many of you have heard through some of the uh, conversations that have happened in the main room at this conference, this Assistant Secretary Alan Davidson was talking about some of the programs that his agency is in charge of. So Congress has made tens of billions of dollars available in order to get network connectivity to consumers and to small businesses. And this is really important too. We've estimated when you take into account the COVID emergency funding, so the CARES Act money that could be used towards network investment, as well as the BEAD funding, the American um, Rescue Plan money, we think it's about $100 billion that's being used um, in the U.S. to bring more network connectivity. Some of that, in fact, a lot of it will be last mile. So that's what we think of as from the ISP, you know, from, from essentially like their network connectivity point in your community all the way to your home. And some of it will be used for middle mile. There is a great middle mile need um, here in the U.S. And then in addition to that, Encompass recently did a report with Analysis Mason, and I think David Abacasis is somewhere in the room. Um, we worked with him to evaluate what's the investment that's being made by tech companies, streaming companies into the internet that's bringing more of the global internet connectivity. So from the caches that you just saw um, to the other kinds of subsea cable investment that's being made. And the estimate there is over $120 billion annually is going into the network around the world in order to ensure that consumers and businesses can obtain the services and content that they want online. Thanks, Angie. I want to um, ask David Don the same question here. Um, curious what Comcast is doing on the infrastructure front uh, to account for all of this, right, giant amounts of streaming that we're doing and the ongoing evolution towards streaming. Thank you, Ann. Um, thank you for having me here. Uh, this is obviously, we are the company at the forefront of all of this investment, right? Comcast for the last four years has invested over $20 billion. And a lot of you probably are familiar with the campaign we just launched around the Super Bowl with Xfinity 10G. So there's the network you have to build to make this content get to the consumer. And we are leading providers of that. And then of course, also on the video content side, we're trying to figure out where this is going. We obviously were leaders in the linear marketplace and now we're trying to hedge our bets, I guess you could say, or figure out where this is going. We've launched a new product called Zumo, where we're building a platform for companies like Netflix and, and YouTube and Peacock, I must say, without getting in trouble. <laughs> so we're on all sides of this transaction. And what you see is, as Angie suggested, billions and billions of dollars of investment. What's interesting, I wanted to share a statistic with this group that I don't know if everyone necessarily would know, but how much of the internet content do you guys think is actually video streaming content? And the pre-COVID 
versus the post-COVID number. Does anyone have any guesses? Tomas? How much? 80%? Not quite. 65% of all content on the internet is streaming video. Now, we're all here in Washington. We meet with policymakers and we talk about commerce and civic engagement and entertainment. But it turns out most of what people are doing on the internet is streaming video. Now, pre-COVID, it was about 65% and video conferencing was about 1%. Post-COVID, video conferencing makes up how much of the internet content? 3%. It is still 65% cat videos and stranger things. And so we have these intellectual debates about how important the internet is for everything, civic engagement and education and work from home. But what's really sustaining this network and what's justifying the investment that we're making and Angie's uh, members are making is the customer demand for video content. And at Comcast, we're on both sides of it. We're going to be there for the video side, of course. And on the network side, the 10G, this 10G uh, effort we're launching here to get everyone connected to gigabit networks, symmetrical multi-gigabit networks eventually. That's all part of giving customers what they want and which is the content we're all producing here. Now seems like the right time to uh, loop in YouTube when we're talking about video streaming. Uh, Alexandra would love to hear about how YouTube thinks about streaming and about our networks. Oh, thanks for that question. Um, I love it because I think uh, YouTube's role actually sits at the middle of a lot of the work happening across this panel. So uh, just to start with YouTube's mission, it's to give everyone a voice and show them the world and to ground us in a sense of scale here. That means 500 hours of content are uploaded to YouTube every minute, and we have 2 billion monthly users. So enormous scale and reach. Uh, Angie and David talked about investment. Uh, we rely on that investment, that infrastructure for our videos to reach consumers, give users the content they love uh, where they are. Uh, for other streaming platforms, people, friends like Netflix, we see ourselves as a key partner, a force multiplier for their creative content. So uh, just to give you an example from this morning, I observed that Netflix's main YouTube channel has 26 million subscribers on our platform. And I may or may not have noticed that because I was watching the trailer for season five of Drive to Survive. Anybody else in here? Uh, and then, you know, David, my friend David mentioned cat videos, uh, cat videos and more, right, on YouTube in terms of Absolutely. our content. Uh, so uh, I, I will always say that uh, YouTube's creators are the heart of our platform. I think in forums like these over the years, we've talked a lot about uh, the power of the free and open internet, about the democratization of content. Uh, YouTube really is a realization of that dream where our global reach and scale means new stories are being told by uh, underrepresented creators, uh, diversity of viewpoints, uh, exportation of culture. So a really excited creative moment on the platform. Thanks. Um, I think I would be remiss if I didn't mention the digital divide at this point, right? The benefits of all this amazing content sadly don't reach all Americans. Some stats say one in five Americans do not have access to broadband in the home. Um, that could be because of an access issue, affordability, digital skill gap, et cetera. Um, I wanted to ask Karam a question on this in particular because you represent, um, particularly about the rural digital divide, you represent ISPs in Maine and Vermont. Uh, and really curious what your work to bridge the divide and bring the benefits of streaming or the benefits of broadband writ large uh, to folks, what that looks like in your day to day. I wish I represented all the ISPs in Maine, <laughs> but um, I think I'm a voice for the 1,500 to 2,000 ISPs that exist with our brothers and sisters like Comcast. Um, so a little bit of context bef before I, I'm brave enough to answer the question. Uh, it's actually not one in five that don't have access to broadband. It's 150 million Americans do not have access to broadband as federally defined by 25 by three. Just think about that. We're very blessed, we're very fortunate we can do this, but the majority of the United States, especially in the rural areas, do not have access to 25 by three. Which is amazing actually, if you think about it, that, that's an enormous scale. The GDP of Maine is 60 billion, the GDP of Vermont is 30 billion. 
The annual economic output of the United States is $27 trillion, comprises mostly of small businesses. Those small businesses in rural areas can't even access payroll data because they're on less than 25 by 3 connectivity. So what is Comcast and we are doing? Enormous, enormous, enormous generational work. Think about the rural electrification program in the 1910s to the 1940s, the National Highway Transportation System from the 50s to the 60s. What we are all involved in right now will impact our lives and our kids' lives for the next at least 100 years. At least. In most areas, actually, when we hang fiber optic cable, we're still doing it on aerial poles that were put up in the 1910s. So think about those decisions that we're all collectively making as a society right now. About 10 to 15 percent of Americans are below the poverty line, let alone affording broadband. They can't afford a cell phone. So how do we make sure that's equitable? How can we make sure it's universally accessible and affordable? The telecommunications industry in the past has redlined. Let's be honest about it. There are BIPOC communities, immigrant communities in Maine and Vermont that don't have internet in the middle of a metropolitan city like Portland, Maine, which has a population of about 120,000 people. It's amazing. So what are we doing about it? We build gigabit fiber optic networks like Comcast. 2,000 ISPs in the United States ever is building, building, building. Part of it is driven by the enormous federal incentives, monies that are generational. This will never, ever happen in my lifetime again. And I'm fairly youngish on the younger side, I think. Um, and then there's private capitalists pulling into this. But I think the interesting thing to rem remember is there are areas in this country that do not have choice of a provider. Again, we're very blessed. We have many providers in the metro areas, does not exist in the rural areas. So we, as a participatory democracy, feel, GWI feels very strongly to its core that everybody should have access, that everybody should participate in democracy. So if 60, 70 percent of us are watching content and that content is video, I can assure you that will change drastically in the next 10 to 15 years. Because in a state like Maine or Vermont, for example, it is enormously expensive to get telemedicine. You can't. You can't get doctors out there. Hospitals are closing. So how does the elderly population, Maine is, by the way, the second oldest in the country, how does it get access to world class medicine? Telemedicine is the answer, but in order to get telemedicine, you need infrastructure. Or workers, for that matter. You know, demographics are shifting. Young families want to move out of the metro areas into places where they feel they can be safe growing their kids. Well, if they're going to remote work, they need broadband. So you have an enormous cultural change also happening at the same time. If we are to change the paradigm, which is equity, and I know Chris will talk, talk about it, we have to lean in and put a shoulder in all together on equitable terms and get to everybody. And that's what GWI does, that's what 2,000 ISPs do in the country. Those communities, those kids, do you know that in my, in my city, that I, in Portland, Maine, during the pandemic, two out of 10 kids didn't get a chance to do their homeworks. Parking lots in libraries were full because that's the only place they could get Wi-Fi. That's enormous. So we owe something to our kids that they have access to be able to at least do their homework. So that's, those are the things that we're trying to do in the rural areas or rural-ish areas. Rural-ish, I like that. Um, my, I'd like to ask Chris sort of the other side of the coin here, which is what we call you know, broadband adoption. So there are folks who may have access to a network. They may uh, be able theoretically to uh, connect, but they are not. There are folks who are not streaming. Um, is that bad? It's, it's only bad if they are choosing not to stream uh, because they have the option. Uh, uh, you know, Krim talked about uh, the digital divide, and, and I think you highlighted how it's not just rural, it's urban and rural uh, when it comes to infrastructure, whether there's concerns about redlining. But on the adoption side, uh, that is also across the board, rural, urban, suburban, uh, a challenge for closing the digital divide, um, either because of affordability, um, 
or because of uh, what, you know, for years, uh, Pew used to have in their surveys come up as relevance, is really people valuing and knowing what they would do with broadband when they got it. Uh, if it's relevant in your life, then you, you typically want it. And, and there's work to, to do there. Um, thankfully, uh, there's a wonderful field that really is growing over the last, uh, you know, I feel like I, I've been aware of it for the last seven or eight years. I know it's older than that, the folks out there who do digital equity work, uh, the digital equity field, but it's really booming now um, in part because of the investment, first time ever federal investment uh, in the Digital Equity Act that was a part of the infrastructure package. Um, before that, digital equity work on the ground to make, help people get connected to broadband, um, to help people understand when you get broadband, how you can uh, use it to better your lives. Uh, that work was largely being funded by philanthropy and quite frankly, partnerships with ISPs and local communities. Um, and the fact that the federal government invested in digital equity for the first time ever recognizes just how important it is to close the digital divide. So those two, those second and third prongs to go with the infrastructure on what drives the digital divide are critically important, the affordability gap and the adoption gap uh, that's largely driven by that, that relevance issue. Um, we have more work to do on this, of course, uh, whether it's uh, figuring out what our long-term solution is on affordability. You know, right now we have the, the affordable, affordable Connectivity Fund or uh, program, the ACP at the FCC. That money will run out uh, probably early next year. Uh, we need a long-term solution on affordability because, uh, well, or, or else we need a long-term solution on poverty. Take your pick. I think the easier solution is to figure out a long-term solution on affordability. Um, and, and then I would love to continue to see a long-term investment on uh, the digital equity needs, because as technology um, grows and innovates, uh, uh, people will need to continue to learn how to use it and connect to it. Um, uh, the cat videos might be the draw. Uh, I understand the point about the 65%, but the but I, I feel like the greatest value is the stuff that comes with it. So, uh, you know, the standard that we talked about, uh, Carm talked about 25.3 as being a a minimum standard, the standards that we aspire to that were in the infrastructure bill were there because once you get the cat, once the cat video is bringing you in, what does a household need to take full advantage of, of the technology? Uh, and that means while someone's watching a cat video, someone being able to do telemedicine in the same household. While someone's teleworking and their kid's watching a cat video, can the kid who has a learning disability uh, have supplemental videos that their school has it's told them they need to watch to pre-teach and reteach uh, um, uh, a lesson. You know, these are these are things that educators will tell you are very important for supporting students with uh, with additional needs. And so, these are the sorts of things that streaming video, while uh, it may not be highlighted, uh, you know, in the sixty-five percent, uh, I think are critically important because the, that streaming video going to our students, going to our our patients. Um, so, uh, so yeah, adoption and understanding the full gamut of what you get with, with broadband is critically important. Thanks, Chris. Um, I want to pivot a little bit now that we have an understanding of what the actual infrastructure is that supports Cat Videos Plus, I'll say. Um, let's talk about the content, the fun stuff, right? Um, my favorite content these days is Get Ready With Me TikToks. Um, I'm curious to hear uh, from other folks. We'll get to later what we're watching, but... Um, Chris, I'm hoping you could put on your consumer advocate hat here for a second. I think you may have already had it on. Uh, but if you could talk to us about the state of play in the streaming market generally and um, what it means for consumers. Yeah, I try not to take it off. Um, <laughs> it's an exciting time because if you had asked us about it a decade ago, consumer advocates were saying that um, that consumers did not, we, we did not have the choices that we wanted in the marketplace, even though we we knew streaming was coming and it was starting to come uh, through a few services. Um, now we're seeing the reality of what we always wanted, greater choice for consumers, um, not full a la carte that many of us had talked about, but closer to a la carte. Uh, you, you don't have to subscribe to every streaming service. Sorry, uh, everyone who owns a <laughs> streaming service. Uh, if someone chooses not to, that's their choice. And, and yes, they miss out on some content. Uh, but that's more of the consumer choice model that we were hoping for. Um, and, and that's a good thing. Um, uh, you know, I think the fact, I, I said this to David the other day, uh, the, the fact that Comcast, 
a leader in linear video, uh, has its own streaming service uh, and, and is a part of this, this panel and part of this mix, just shows you the shift that we've gone over the last decade. So um, it, it's an exciting time and we hope that those barriers uh, uh, that, uh, that were up there, uh, you know, with a few choices or, or having to go through one company to get access uh, to all the content, we hope, we hope those stay down. The, the more open the choices are for consumers, the better. Uh, I wanted to follow up with that. Karam, on our prep call, you used a really interesting phrase. Um, you talked about uh, access to culture through streaming. I'm wondering if you could share with this group what that means if once your, your customers have access to a whole new world of types of people, what, what that can look like. Yeah, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, we're all storytellers. Streaming is storytelling. And streaming, storytelling, whether it's as a video, I mean, I'm Station Eleven, I'm watching again, so. Um, but, um, you know, it's your town hall meeting. It is uh, being able to access things that you may not have access to. And I, in the, at least in the Northeast cor Corridor, the opening of culture is immensely, immensely cool to watch. And there's a cu couple, of, couple of examples. You can actually watch Turkish soap operas on Netflix. I'm not saying that 654 episodes of Ertuğrul is worthy. Mm -hmm. However, it is there. And I think that's important because, for example, it, the fastest growing demographic in the state of Maine is actually immigrants. About 9% from the last census data. The same, similar in Vermont. And that's, so if you just think about it, think about the multiplier effect where people are moving, people are coming in, the ability of, population, the ability of society to see stories that reflect not just themselves, but reflects the other where the other now is not the other but us is immensely important. Let's not, let's not discount that we are seeing each other now thanks to massive amount of content. These stories, the arc of these stories, now we get to see what those narratives either were or what the new narratives need to be or can be. So, for example, I mean, again, these are, these, are, these are examples, right? So there are new families that move into these areas like the Northeast because they believe it's not just a quality, quality of life, but it's also the fact that they can do the things that can actualize themselves as human beings. And you get to do that by reinforcing that through content. My, ki my kids, my kids have learned languages because they have seen content on screen. They have learned what it means to be in some other dimension that belongs and binds us together as a society because of content, whether it's YouTube, Netflix, whatever, whatever that is. But the point, the point is that there's a natural communication that did not exist before this. I couldn't call my mother and I tell her that stuff that I was doing you know, 25 years ago, because long distance call, you had to go to the end of a hallway in a college dorm and be able to get time and get or a buck 25 to call Turkey, for example, or Pakistan for that matter. Now we take it for granted. That's WhatsApp, there's Viber, there's all sorts of things. Content is the same way. It has allowed for frictionless communication across multiple barriers. So it's not just cat videos. It's not even the documentaries. It's not watching Chris Hemsworth climb up a rope like the almighty Thor. It's the fact that we have stories that now we can create and share. So there's an economic lever on that now. So think, just think of the economic lever on being able to create something that now can be monetized and you are doing it. You're in charge. And I'll let you two. And can I jump yeah. in on that Please. point? Because then, that, yeah. you know, when Krem says that streaming is storytelling, uh, absolutely true from the YouTube experience. And when Chris talks about uh, consumer choice, the other side of that consumer choice is the creator economy. So just to ground ourselves in a few facts there, um, in the U.S. alone in 2021, YouTube's creative ecosystem contributed $25 billion to the GDP and supported 425,000 full-time jobs. 
The thing I love about my job is when I tell people I work at YouTube, everybody has a magic of YouTube story, right? My my husband is a self-taught woodworker from YouTube. My daughter learned all about box turtles last weekend on YouTube. <laughs> people have fixed their sinks and learned new languages. Uh, and the reason that we have that magic of YouTube is because of our creators. O over the last three years, YouTube has paid $50 billion dollars to creators, artists, and media companies, many of those uh, uh, small businesses that would not have had an opportunity to exist without the power of a platform like YouTube. Fabulous. Um, I want to pivot us a little bit and talk about a sort of challenging question, um, and it's that of local content and where local content should and does live. Uh, so there are a number of issues here, right? Your local town hall, regional sports, uh, local news, public access networks, things that were traditionally over broadcast um, that people without the digital know-how or the funds to access them in a modern way uh, may no longer be able to see. Um, so there are communities where local programming is so immensely important. Um, does anyone have thoughts on First of all, the state of play here, and then solutions. Yeah, really? Anyone. Okay. <laughs> we made eye contact, so you, Chris. <laughs> okay. I, I mean, the content lives everywhere, um, uh, and that's exciting. You know, if I just think about my own community, uh, you, can, you can watch local government, city council, and school board meetings streaming online, and then the content lives on their servers, and that's the magic of the internet. Um, you could also watch it on cable access if you want to, but, uh, but the internet has it and it's archivable and searchable. Um, uh, uh there are, there is, um, a community that I love of, um, if you can't tell I'm six foot eight, uh, there's a community of former basketball players, uh, in Northern Virginia high school basketball that, that I, I love. And, and, um, they have a YouTube channel with interviews of folks celebrating our community. So great community building created by local community members, um, uh, user-generated content right on YouTube. Um, it, it, that's where I th what I think of when I think of the content that, that's created locally. It's, it's everything that uh, fosters community, that connects people, um, that keeps them informed um, about what's going on in, in their neighborhood. And if I just jump, oh, someone else want to jump in? <laughs> Sorry. And just to jump in on this for a minute, I mean, what we're really getting at, I think, on in the content side is what we've seen th over the last 20 years of what the internet has done is, and it's just changing the power dynamic, and it's empowering consumers mm -hmm. to make the choices they want. So when you ask a question about community content, consumers get to choose more directly. They don't have to worry about whether the cable company is carrying a particular show or, or a community, you know, a uh, council board meeting. And if that council board meeting is at seven o'clock at night or seven o'clock in the morning, to Chris's point, you can get it whenever you want. So what we've done with the internet, fundamentally what we keep getting back to discussion, everyone in this room already knows, um, so we can give you back a few minutes maybe, but fundamentally the internet is empowering consumers to make the choices they want about all content. You talk about the demise of, of regional sports that's happening in front of us right now. Just like a year ago, we would have been talking about linear television, definitely. We are losing linear television subscribers every day, and I'm guessing they're losing a lot of uh, public access television subscribers as well. And it's a problem for civic engagement, but the internet and, and the, the broadband networks are much more empowering. You get it when you want. You can give that feedback probably more directly. So I think it's all, it's gonna work out. There'll be some dislocation in the process, but in the end, what you're doing is you're empowering consumers to make the choices they want instead of sort of these uh, centralized structures we've had for so long. And maybe just to go back on, on empowering storytellers, um, it used to be that to make a professional movie or, or TV show, you'd effectively have to be in California and Hollywood. Uh, suddenly growing up in France, you could see that uh, the French movies were not exactly up to the uh, standard uh, then. Um, for, 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 for Netflix, we have bet very early on to have very local slate and empower uh, a very wide variety of storytellers on the service. And so what it means from a technology standpoint is that we have virtualized 
studio technology, editing technology, VFX technology, so that storytellers around the world have the same capability that the Hollywood studio will have. Uh, and, 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 and the same is available in our production hubs in Georgia, New Mexico, uh, New Jersey, for the creators uh, to produce great content anywhere. Anyone else on this question? Well, for consumers to being able to choose what they want, when they want, and how they want it, it really, sure. It's, it, I was saying for consumers, being able to choose what they want, when they want it, and how they want is empowering, is allowing them to access more than ever before, and giving them new opportunities that they have never had. Um, I feel like we're still kind of in the infancy of seeing what what we get as a result of this. And you were asking, well, what are some of the hard questions, right, that we have to face as we go through these transitions? I put this in the box of a technology transition. Um, and there are government policies that we'll have to wrestle with. David had mentioned linear video programming subscribers are decreasing. And right now, cable companies pay for access to the rights of way for their networks to local government based upon that revenue. And as that revenue declines, there's nothing necessarily replacing it. And so local governments are going to struggle with that. And we're going to have to figure that out, right? They have a budget need. Um, but on the other hand, seeing the opportunities that consumers and businesses have to reach and consume in ways that they've never been able to before, it's worth the struggle to go through the technology transitions, right? It's like, this is, this is a better situation. We don't have a gatekeeper on content like we used to have. Um, consumers through these various, and there are a number of platforms. It's not just the YouTube platform, right? We have a Vimeo platform and a number of other platforms, right? The consumers can choose what they want to use to upload their content and reach their own customers. I like that framing of thinking about this as a technology transition. And I think with any technology transition, right, the transition onto the internet, you know, transition to using email, using Slack for some of my colleagues, right? These are transitions and we need to teach folks how to do it and how to use this new tool. Um, I'm hoping folks on the panel may want to weigh in on um, how do we make onboarding of these new solutions easier for folks? And how do we do it on an iterative basis, right? Streaming is going to keep changing. How do we make sure folks can have access to all the goods? Anyone? I'll, you want to go? No, please. Go ahead. Okay. Well, I'll, one of the things that G, GWI does is uh, we have a dedicated group called the Stream Team that actually helps um, individuals, families cut the cord. It's a presumption that all of us know how to operate a Roku or a Fire Stick or a Chromecast and all that, all that stuff. But the American population of 55 and up is still wedded to a universal remote that they don't have to think too much about. But now they are forced in a good way to exercise choice and try to figure out these myriad of devices and connectivity. What's a smart TV? How do I download an app? You know, what do I do? Which remote do I use? So we help them. The other thing is also, we know exactly what's streaming on what. Majority of the population does not. If they want to watch, um, you know, Tom Brady come back again, I'm not suggesting he should, but uh, the majority of the majority of Americans think that, okay, it's on CBS or whatever, but they don't know that they can get an NFL pass for 99 bucks and be able to watch that whenever they want. So they need help. They need a curation of content, a curation of access, actually. So in order to exercise choice, they need assistance. So ISPs like us, we say, we'll help you. So you tell us what you want to watch, how you want to watch it, how much do you want to pay for it? And here is a menu for you to be able to empower yourself with and go discover and come back. And you'll be amazed, you'll be amazed how empowered they feel by doing that. But you have to help them. You have to help them even possibly connect up the devices. So the use of a network, the use of the underpinning of modern civilization increases when people actually participate and do something. 
It's not enough that Roku's are available at your best buy outlet for 50 bucks. You have to be able to educate and empower, and in some cases actually subsidize that so that they can access it. If, if we are to be a digitally equitable society, if we are to be diverse and inclusive, we have to have the moral, financial, and social obligation to lean in and help. Otherwise, you'll have much greater digital divide than we ever thought was humanly possible, and then it's too late. So that's, those are the things that at least we do, and I'm sure Comcast and everybody else has those kind of forward-leaning philosophy. And I think this is the lesson of COVID, right? So what we know during COVID is for those who had the internet, which is about 80% of our country, the internet worked. The internet delivered, the internet's what got us through COVID. All of the videos, the work from home, the school from home is the internet worked. And it was the investment from these companies before COVID that made that possible. What we learned is 20% of Americans don't have access to the internet and still don't, which it's almost shocking when you sit in this room, like how could you not? have it? How could you not think it's relevant, as Chris mentioned? And the answer we're coming down to now, I think, is this concept called digital navigators. Mm -hmm. You know, we've, we at Comcast have been trying to address this problem for a decade with Internet Essentials. We gave it, we, we were selling Internet access for $10 a month, pretty cheap for most Americans can afford it. And yet there's a, there's a cap on the penetration, even at $10 a month. There's a cap when it's free with ACP. We still have two thirds of ACP qualified Americans not taking it. I think it's two thirds or so. So the question is what's going on? Why isn't all of these two thirds of ACP qualified individuals taking it? Why are 20% of Americans not taking it? Price is a factor. That's what ACP and, and other subsidies are meant to address. But there's this relevance, there's this fear about viruses and, and all these things that concern us, cybersecurity. And the idea now is that we're really advocates for is this concept of digital navigators. And you have to canvas door to door kind of what Kareem is saying, and you walk into people's homes and you talk to them about why they should be subscribed to the internet. What are they missing? Whether they're missing the content that these guys are creating here, whether they're missing uh, the, the civic engagement component, right? And of course, all the, the working and schooling from home we're all doing these days. So that is what we've got to tackle is getting those 20% connected. It is the social justice issue, I think, of our time, at least technologically speaking. I said it because I we're big supporters of the digital navigators idea. Um, there's, uh, it's, I think the biggest part of the growing digital equity field. Um, uh, one of the reasons why digital navigators are successful when done right is because you, you bring in people who are in and of the community, uh, to be the digital navigators so that they're trusted on the ground. I know you guys are supporting, uh, folks who come from the community. This is especially important, uh, in the most marginalized communities, like say tribal areas, tribal areas are the, where the digital divide is the greatest. Um, and, and the, the communities there, uh, uh, and this is just what I've heard from folks. I, I'm, I'm not an expert on tribal areas, but, uh, uh, deal with different issues. You know, for example, uh, it's, a, it's more of a, uh, community-based, uh, society in that area rather than maybe pure capitalism. And so folks, uh, are used to being in the public service or a servant leadership uh, frame of mind. Uh, and so they gather resources together in that way rather than saying, oh, we as a tribe will own the broadband provider uh, and charge for service. Uh, so these are things that, you know, uh, working with folks in the community, meeting them where they are and talking about the, the, w the best way to deliver uh, broadband to their community uh, is critically important. I'll add one other thing. Um, when Krum's talking about being forward looking, uh, the digital divide is something we've talked about for decades. We can get ahead of it through smart policymaking when we're careful. So, for example, um, if, uh, if, if the metaverse is what video is now in the future, uh, what are the barriers and do we need policy solutions to support not having a digital divide when we get to um, a, a full-on metaverse? Um, I think of, you know, what is the equivalent of public access uh, where you could go to a studio and record your own show back in the 80s uh, when you have a metaverse, when you have virtual reality? Um, is, it a, is it a shared studio where you can record uh, or create uh, in the metaverse um, your own production? Um, are we equipping people with equipment uh, or are we setting policies that allow you to have equipment that uh, allow folks of all income levels to access uh, the benefits that come with that sort of new technology? 
uh, one of my colleagues has an idea uh, that um, that spectrum policy is incredibly incredibly important for that because if you only put out uh, spectrum uh, by license, then you miss the opportunity to have uh, connected devices that you can wear uh, and that are affordable because they are put out over more shared or unlicensed spectrum. So these are just some initial ideas that we haven't even begun to wrap our heads around, but we should, as folks who care about policy, to get ahead of these digital divides um, so that we're not just talking about streaming video, we're talking about full-on immersive technologies. I want to carry on in that same vein and talk about future-proofing, right? So we hear a lot, particularly with the IIJA and bead funding, about creating future-proof networks. Um, as video becomes more and more relevant, as David shared, 63% of content is video. Um, as we move to 8K televisions, we all have 8K televisions in our home. At what point is future-proof not really future-proof? Um, is there a world where our infrastructure can't keep up with uh, the demands of video? Question for anyone. Yeah, maybe if I can, if I can jump in here. I think first, I mean, there's a couple of distinctions we can make. The first one is that more video or more video quality does not uh, direct uh, linearly, let's say, uh, translate into more data. Uh, specifically, why? Because video is heavily encoded, and this is an area where uh, Netflix also invests significantly to make basically. Uh, the best quality of image with the least possible amount of data. So in the last five years, for the same quality of, a, of streaming, we, we cut our bitrate, divided the amount of data by two. So cut the bitrate in half. Uh, just to, to give a sense, and, and, I, and I think this will illustrate why KRM was describing this uh, upgrade to fiber as really truly generational. I think it's multi-generational. I think today, 4K video is about 15 megabits, uh, megabit per second on Netflix. So if Comcast can offer 10 gig to the home, that's over 600 uh, uh, simultaneous uh, 4K streams into your home. That's a lot of video. Um, we're hopeful, I was speaking with the um, engineers who, who developed those codecs, we're thinking we'll be able to get to over a thousand, uh, a thousand concurrent 4K streams on a, on a 10 gig connection. So less than 10 megs for a 4K stream. And so there's, uh, there's, there is a theoretical limit, uh, entropy for, for video compression, but we're not there yet. There's definitely a uh, headroom uh, for, for future progress. So fiber is definitely, certainly as far as video is concerned, uh, future proof from a, a generational standpoint. Uh, and then the other distinction maybe is, of course, we have fiber in the last mile and, and it's very clear from this panel that uh, we'll need a whole lot of uh, content to uh, attract people to subscribe to more last mile. Uh, beyond the last mile is really the core networks, the uh, the heart of the internet. You know, uh, Netflix is distributed in all those various locations, uh, but you still have those big uh, equipment, those interconnection points where the whole internet uh, connects. Northern Virginia is one of them, and then all the various interconnection hubs. There, what we see is that even though the amount of data grows, generally efficiency uh, in the equipment, the new routers, the new switches make it so that the growth of data is also uh, sustainable from a, from from that point of view. Anyone else? I was going to say similar to Tomas. So I, I I am a physicist also. The theoretical limit on a fiber optic light exceeds about a petabyte a second. It's going to be a long time before humanity, especially in the residential area, feels it needs that. But that's the gener multi generational impact. I'm not sure anything is future proof, but within the limits of physics and human knowledge at the current time, passing light through a fiber optic cable is pretty darn good. So, and it just means changing electronics on the head ends. And as Moore's law has shown us and verified, things will get cheaper, smaller, and much more easier to install. So I, come on, and, and we can, and yeah, and, and uh, just adding, we can see it looking back, right? I mean, the coax cable, uh, or, or, or the copper uh, twisted pairs, you know, they lasted for decades and, 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 and generation and fiber optics is way more capable than that. One of the things that the deployment companies have really been working on in the U.S. is bringing everyone into the conversation about when you're tearing up a street, 
make sure that you're coordinating and upgrading the facilities. And one of the things that has really been adopted as a best practice is build um, extra capacity in the conduit so that if, as you need additional fiber, it's cheaper to install that fiber um, so you don't have to dig up the streets again to, to do it. Great. Now I want to ask my question, which is, what's everybody streaming these days? So if I can, if I can start. Um, so one of the perks of being a Netflix employee is that you get to watch shows in advance. Mm -hmm. oh. It is also, unfortunately, the surest way to get fired in, a, in case you leak <laughs> information. So I will try very hard not to do this. Uh, I am super excited. And, and being also a little bit of a uh, uh, patriotic Frenchman myself, I will give you two hints. I'm very excited about Murder Mystery 2, upcoming movie uh, uh, with Adam Sandler and Jennifer Aniston, uh, some of the scenes taking place in Paris, and also super excited about our upcoming uh, Drive to Survive like document docu-series on Tour de France uh, that will be on the service uh, very soon. Some of the first images were actually uh, uh, released on the internet uh, last week, so you can look it up. One by one, yeah. You mean besides YouTube cooking videos? <laughs> we watched a few of those yesterday. New teriyaki sauce I found last night. <laughs> um, I like American Auto. Dry, funny, highly recommended. Um, that's all I'll say about it. You, could, you should see it, see what you think. And it's on Peacock and NBC. <laughs> okay, so my staff that's here is just going to shoot daggers at me, but because um, all I do is talk about NCAA women's gymnastics this time of the year, <laughs> and I uh, guess they hear about every meet um, after the weekend, but I actually subscribe to the Big Ten Network because I wanted to track Michigan, which is number three right now in the U.S., um, but I, we're big LSU family. My daughter's a junior at LSU. She was a former gymnast, um, never made it as far to be able to compete in college. So we are rooting for number six LSU to, to make it all the way to nationals this year. Well, I'll mention a couple YouTube creators I'm loving these days. So the first is a channel called Homeworthy, which is a fabulous home tours, interior design. I think this came about in COVID when the idea of getting to go to another person's house all of a sudden seemed exotic and wonderful. Uh, and then, David, you might like this one, Made with Lao. Uh, this is a Chinese uh, cooking at home. Wow. Uh, I think you might like that one. And then I'll also mention, I bet some folks in here uh, probably also watch Alison Roman's YouTube channel, a, a great uh, cook who's coming out with a new book and she has some new content on YouTube I watched this weekend. Oh, those are really good. <laughs> um, as I mentioned, I'm re-watching uh, Station Eleven, uh, which is possibly the second best TV show ever made after lost so we can have that we can have that uh, com conversation but the one i'm actually really enjoying is the last days of ptolemy gray um which is by samuel jackson one of my favorite actors um it's pretty cool to see uh, samuel jackson just just rule the screen it's just i urge you to watch it it's really cool you guys are much classier than me <laughs> Really, no one's just going to out yourself like, I will. No, no, I watch Love is Blind. I love it. <laughs> yeah. All right. That is entertaining television. Um, as well as The Mandalorian Season 3. Uh, uh, the, the, the first one was up. I think we have to end the panel there. <laughs> Yep. Oh, I'm watching um, The Last of Us on HBO. Oh, yeah. I call it Spooky Scary Fungus, mm -hmm. uh, although I'm an episode behind, so no spoilers, please. Um, thank you all again to our panel. I will not keep folks from coffee, so I think that will be outside. But thank you all again for joining us and giving up for our panel. Okay.